Hello Dream Theater fans and welcome back to episode number four of the Let's Learn Awake guitar series. Today we will be covering every single note, every single time change, every single chord progression and a full detailed musical analysis of Erotomania. Now, who is the Erotomaniac within the group? Today we are going to find the perp, or should I say the perv of Dream Theater. Now is it Kevin James Labrie? Or is it some other Kevin that will not be named until probably later in this episode, who definitely has a fixation with the numbers 6 and 9, with the number of 6-9 chords he creates? We're going to find out soon enough. The first riff of Erotomania I could describe as a highly chromatic, yet oddly modal, type of situation. So let's check out that first riff that sounds like this. We have to use fingers 1, 2, 3, and 4 going up a spider crawl. 2, 3, 4, 5, 2, 5, 4, 3. And then we just shift it up to the fourth fret, open four, five, six, seven, four, seven, six, five. Now, rhythmically speaking, we're in the time signature of five, four, which is split up in a grouping of four and two groupings of three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, the next measure that comes up is a measure of 9-8. So instead of having a grouping of 4 and two groupings of 3, you have a grouping of 4, a grouping of 3, and a grouping of 2. So one less note. So let's have that happen in context. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three. You see how that works in context? That measure of 9-8 just cuts off one note at the very tail end of the, uh, of the riff. Now, theoretically, we can't really tell what's going on without the keyboard part. So let's take a listen to Kevin Moore's keyboard part isolated here. So really, it's just a four chord progression. What are these guys, the Ramones all of a sudden? The first chord is an E sus 2, okay? going to a C sus2, and then this really odd 6-9 chord. Oh my god. We already have a 6-9 chord and we didn't even start the song yet. Okay? You see what I'm saying about this guy? Unbelievable. So I'm going to say we're in the key of E minor. We kind of go between E minor and E major, so just bear with me as we go through this. Um, we start off with the E sus2, that's the one chord. The C sus2, which is the flat 6, then the C sharp 6 9, which we can call a natural 6, right? Or the, uh, the minor 6 chord, which would be part of the E major scale instead of E minor. So a mode mixture right there. Um, it also has the A sharp on top, which indicates a Lydian mode. Then we go to this, the D sus2, which is a flat 7th chord. Now the keyboard follows the same timing as the guitar. One two three four one two three one two three one two three four one two three one two three one two three four one two three one two three one two three four one two three one two one two three four. See that? That measure of nine eight in there needs to be hit with perfect accuracy. Now here's a little Easter egg for you. I'm going to play this riff nice and slowly with the open B and E strings on the top to sort of illustrate the sound, the texture of E minor during this, or E, a general, uh, a general E vibration. So pretty cool sounds, right, that you get from all these different chromatic notes which interact with the note E. All different colors and textures that uh, really make this incredibly colorful. That's why they call it the chromatic scale. Chroma is the root word, which means color. This 
next section of erotomania rounds off what I would call section A and section B. Okay, so we have an A and a B section going back and forth during this first part of the song. So finger-wise, we start off in the seventh fret position, outlining an E Lydian shape. All right, so that's the root, the fifth, the flatted fifth, or the sharp four, and then a major third. And you got to change positions right in the middle. We then head into what could be called a D major seven with a sharp four as well, but just separating all the notes. C sharp D using fingers one, two, four, and three. And then going right down to this crazy flat nine interval, down to a G natural. Now that G natural outlines another part on the keyboard that I'm gonna go over later. And then we go down an F add nine shape, which is the flat two chord or the Neapolitan to get back to the E. Now the time signature starts off in five four, so five beats per measure. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Then we hit into two measures of three, followed by a measure of two. So this is kind of crazy here. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, back into the five. Let me stop and just talk about those few notes. So we're heading in on this D minor shape, which starts at the third fret of the D string. Three, five, seven, five, right? That's the flat third, the fourth, and the fifth going to the root. And then you're doing the same thing in a C position at the third fret. And then this chromatic C sharp C B, just for a little extra domination. The second time around, we're greeted with a high lead guitar, which comes up these rake type of shapes. So all that's happening here is we're raking up the 10th fret of the G, B, and E strings, going up a D minor shape to outline that D minor chord we had before. Then we just go up to the 12th and the 13th, down to the 10th of the B. Then we do the same exact thing on the C. And then this. Now, believe it or not, those three notes actually do follow sort of a melodic thing at the end. So the entire thing is pretty consonant given the, uh, the erratic nature of where the notes are moving. Now, is it any surprise that Kevin Moore is going to come in and take this from a great section to a spectacular section? Let's hear his part isolated right here. Now from the onset, there's nothing too crazy going on. He's following along with the E Lydian situation with the one chord going like this, going from the power chord to the tritone and back to the power chord, and then he's doubling what Petrucci is doing with the D chord, which is technically the flat seven chord now, and then he's going like this. He's outlining an F add nine chord, but resolving it to the F. Now his part actually comes in and touches the notes that Petrucci plays underneath just in a higher octave, right? So that two to one resolution is happening as Petrucci is doing this. So think of this equaling. Now the first ending of this part is outlined by two power chords that Kevin Moore is playing. Now he's playing a D power chord like this. So that's over the D chord we heard before, right? So a minor flat seven. Then he's going up a half step to outline the C minor chord. Now, let's hear that with the root notes on the bottom. There's the first chord, perfectly congruent, and then this. By bringing that power chord up a half step into the C, and everybody else moving down a whole step with the root note, we create a C minor seventh chord. Now that's not even the most interesting part. At the very end, the second ending, Kevin Moore does the same thing with the uh, ascending power chord. And then we hit this. Yeah, that's actually in there. Isn't that crazy? That's what it actually sounds like in the song. He's doing like a May Ray Do, or like an E flat minor, uh, flat three, two, one. Just something really basic with the note B flat on top. 
And then as those chromatic notes happen on the bottom, C sharp, you have basically, it's almost like an F sharp chord in second inversion. And then this shape, which is a C and an F played together, and a B flat on top, so it's like a C7 sus4. And then to this, which is a B major 7th chord, right? Let's take a little bit of time to appreciate that. It's a shame it goes by so fast. And then that's it. That's all you get. Now the next section is a great example of taking a very simple idea, just four chromatic notes, and splitting it up into three different sections to make it far more complex than it has to be. So let's check out the first part that happens there. Now the only part that makes this tricky is the time signature. In this first section, we're just holding out 3rd fret, 2nd fret, 1st fret, open, 3rd fret, 2nd fret, 1st fret, open, okay, with an alternating time signature pattern of 11-8 and 10-8. Now the 11-8 is counted out like this, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, and the 10-8 is counted like this, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, so that we total to a respective 11 and 10, makes sense. The second part of this idea, which uses the notes G, F sharp, F, and E, deals with a little bit of syncopation, a little bit of rhythmic play between all of the members of the band. And I'm going to do my best to illustrate this uh, without any kind of hiccups. <laughs> So this section is kind of like a game of leapfrog, but one that will actually get you banned from your school. So you go like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Very hard to play and count at the same time, but if you slow it down, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. So you're coming in on the third beat of every three and the second beat of every two. The bass part is easy. It just comes in on every one just like before. So the keyboard part is incredibly tricky because it actually comes in on the two of each three phrase. So John Myung is hitting on number one, Kevin Moore is hitting on number two, and John Petrucci is hitting on number three, while Mike Portnoy just plays around with his stupid pots and pans. <laughs> What a madman Kevin Moore is. He has an exquisite sense of time, yet such a perverted sense of creativity. I think we're starting to get pretty close to uh, who the perpetrator of this erotomania actually is. The final section of this three-part chromatic riff goes like this. So now we're just playing on every single beat with a palm muted power chord and we want to be extra heavy, extra chunky. Now once you get through that, we hit these three chords. Now that's a D, a C sharp, and a C power chord. Now what makes this very interesting is that the bass line, the root note, is on G, F sharp, and F. Alright, so when you put a D power chord on top of a G, it sounds like this. When you put a C sharp power chord on top of an F sharp, it sounds like this. And then the same thing happens when you do it chromatically on the F. So, really, it's a D5 over G, or a G add 9, F sharp add 9, F add 9. So, hearkening back to the F add 9 of the earlier section. Now let's just take another moment to appreciate Kevin Moore's genius. Take a look at the isolated part on that last section.
It appears to be an organ patch playing in a diminished scale. All right, so all half steps and whole steps. C, B, A, B, A, G sharp, and then back up. All playing with that rhythm. Now it interacts with the, with the root notes in a very interesting way. Let me play this slowly for you. He took the time out of his day to put a microscope under each one of those groupings of three and two, and every single one of those notes just has the perfect, perfect, perfect counterpoint on the top. After we play those three chromatically descending power chords, we hit the first guitar solo of the song. It plays the chromatic riff in 5-4. So do not stop playing in 5-4, or I'm gonna find you, I'm gonna catch you, and I'm gonna eat you. That's a pretty wild ride, huh? So let's break it up into tiny little sections here so we can figure out what's going on. We start off with some two string unison bends. The first one being on the 14th fret of the high E and the 17th of the B for an F sharp. Then we come down to this one, a real quick blipper, and then we do this. We have an F sharp on the top, which is the, uh, we can call that the root note. We can say that we're loosely playing in an F sharp scale. And then we come down to the melody note D, which actually lands on the G once the riff comes back around. Right? So, then we hit this bend, which is actually on top of the G sharp. So the intervals that occur during that section are a major ninth, a minor ninth, oh boy. Then a tritone, perfect fourth, and an octave. So, I don't know. Make, make of that what you will. So let me play that first section slow. Here's section number two. So once again, some more very colorful chromatic tones outlining the riff on the bottom. Now I see this as some sort of F sharp scale, so we're moving up the minor third, major third, perfect fourth, then one, six, flat seven. So I just see that as maybe an F sharp blues type of thing, which makes sense. We're starting on the note F sharp. Then we do this. And that's just an intervallic movement. Makes sense with the, uh, with the rest of what's going on. And then we do this. Now that G is the target here. Now everything else is sort of loosely based in F sharp because we're doing a couple of perfect fourths above the root note on the 19th and 14th fret of the E string and the B string. So we're pulling off and then we're hitting the 15th fret right at the end. Now that lands right on the G on the low riff. Okay, so we're playing very melodically here. We continue through that section doing this. So we're alternate picking 16th notes down that same perfect fourth pattern. 1914, 1914, going down to the octave. So this time we're on 1611. Same exact notes, just down an octave. And then we're going like this with an A add 9 shape resolving to a B. So all those notes jive pretty well if we think of this as being a G sharp minor chord. The G sharp being the root, and we have the minor third up top, the flat seven, doing the flat seven again, the eleventh, and then doing the same intervals down at the bottom. So it kind of makes sense. It's just a very jazzy way of approaching that. So we think of that as G sharp minor, perhaps. So I'm starting to think that this chord progression is now more based in an F sharp minor to G and G sharp minor to A very loosely. We'll see what happens later on. The next section goes like this. 
So a little disjointed, a little, a little wild and wacky there. It makes me feel like I'm uh, living in a cartoon. We start on a lick that's based in a G Lydian, which makes sense because our second chord, quote unquote, is a G. And yes, they are using the Lydian mode because the C sharp is in the riff. So we're going like this. 12, 15, 14, and then 12, 0, 12. Now that 12, 0, 12, you hit the octave below by pulling off to the open string. Then once we hit the G sharp, we're going up to F sharp again, so that's a minor seventh. Coming right off of that F sharp, we're playing a power chord on a D sharp. All right, so I guess that could make some sense right there. You're actually turning this into a G sharp add nine. Okay. And then just going along with the the octave notes of the riff on the bottom. So you're playing C sharp, E, and D sharp, which is happening in the riff, right? Now when you hit the A, you're coming to the root on the high note and you're fluttering between the A and the B, root and the ninth. The last part sounds like this. So this is just a bunch of chromatic mumbo jumbo starting in an F sharp minor pentatonic position. Uh, so we're kind of going like this. We're starting at the 17th fret, have all your fingers ready like this, and we're going to head down. Alright, so all of those notes, we have 17, 16, 15, 14, then 17, 15, 14, and then we do 16, 15, 14, and 17, 16, 15. So just remember where all of those are, and uh, you're basically just traversing it in a very linear fashion. You're coming down and coming up and coming down. You're coming down, you're coming up, you're coming down. And then you just continue all the way down to the bottom of the barrel, which is the 15th fret of the D string. Then we come up to this high F sharp on the 19th fret of the B, and we do this stupid little chromatic thing on the... Uh, 19th to the 21st fret, right? So 19, 20, 21, 19, 20, 21. Almost sounds like Manic Depression by Jimi Hendrix. But don't play it like that because uh, it sounds bad. Let me play the whole solo for you nice and slow so you can see the change in positions and uh, all the frets. So the next section introduces our brand new key center. We're now shifting into the key of G sharp minor and eventually into the relative major B. So this occupies a, another middle section of erotomania. Now it's a very straightforward pentatonic riff. All right, it's in 4-4 and uh, nothing really too crazy going on, just some slides and some little bits in there. So uh, just take a listen. So we're just riding along on the 4th fret of the low E with our ring finger and we're going like this. Two, two, slide into the 4th. Alright, you gotta make sure you do that. If you don't do that, we're gonna fail. Ready? Watch. Slide. So barely give that 2nd fret of the A string any credence whatsoever when you come around to it that time. Just use it as a little grace note coming up into the, uh, the C sharp. And then you're using that to pivot into the next position, which is 4th fret, 6th fret, 4th fret, right? To get into the flat 7 mode. The second half goes like this. It actually sounds a little bit easier in a way. You're pushing into the 2nd fret of the A string, and by push I mean rhythmically pushing. A push beat is when you anticipate the next beat or you hit the next beat earlier than the next beat actually happens, right? So, and this is a very slow tempo if you're counting in 16th notes, so you're actually coming in on the uh of that beat. 
And the last part is just almost outlining an F sharp chord, but still further reinforcing the idea that we have a flat seven in our minor pentatonic scale, G sharp minor. This whole next section is kind of long winded, so I'm just going to show you the entire thing in one shot, and then I'm going to break it down when we're finished. majority of this section is in a time signature of 9-4, okay? But I'm going to break it down uh, in halves. So some measures we're going to be splitting up 4 and 5, others we're going to be splitting up 5 and 4. So just pay attention to that while uh, we're going through this. But it's a 9-4 all the way through until it's not. So check this out. Here's the first bit. Now this is how I'll break it down. I'm going to say we're going to count to five and then four. It might make it a little bit easier that way. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. And that's it. Now here we're just outlining notes within the G-sharp minor scale, right? The flat seven, the one, two, three, and the four. The next measure of nine goes into a B major pattern and then shifts into a C-sharp minor pattern, which then climbs down this oddly angular type of idea. So check this out. So we're playing around with this B major idea and going right to C sharp. That's up a C sharp minor triad right there, so the four chord. So we're going to the, uh, the major three chord to the four chord, minor four chord, and then hopping down this shape. Right, so we're we're anticipating a Lydian mode here. See how we're hopping down the notes of an E chord now? Major 7, 5th, sharp 4, 2, 1. Now let's talk about the rhythmic breakdown of that section. This time I'm going to flip the script. I'm going to start with a measure of 4 instead of measure of 5. So we're going to go 4, then 5, and equal 9. Check it out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, so far, we have a G-sharp minor, a B, a C-sharp minor, then coming into an E chord. Now, this next section outlines basically E and F-sharp, and it gives us a very Lydian sound. So, check it out. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, So, like I said, outlining an E Lydian mode. E to G-sharp. That's E to the major third. You're just scaling up Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then we're coming up to the F sharp. The exact same thing. Mary Had a Little Lamb. Three, two, one. And then we go like this. That's all a first inversion E major chord, right? Because you have the G sharp on the bottom, which is the major third, to the root. Scaling down. And then we do a first inversion F chord triplets on that run. So in totality we have the G sharp minor is the one, B as a three chord, C sharp minor is the minor four, E as the flat six, F as the flat seven, E in first inversion, flat six, and then F sharp flat seven first inversion. We then resolve back into G sharp minor like this, all single notes, the same weird rhythm, just going through different notes of the scale, leading down to E once again. Now this time it's a little easier. Now we finally go into four with this. Now let me just explain something to you real quick. Technically speaking, timing wise, this is not that difficult. Um, but there is a technique that makes it a little bit difficult here, and that's because of the hammer-ons and the pull-offs going into the power chords. So you have to hold that E power chord like this, and then as soon as you're done with that hammer-on, you got to get right into an F-sharp power chord. So you better be using the right fingers. Now this one's hard too, because you got to go like this. You're hammering into a first inversion. 
power chord, quote unquote. Using the same notes in the scale and then doing the same thing up here. So that can kind of make it a little bit tricky because it's it's sort of an odd motion going from with the ring finger and then but as long as you play it within position and you practice doing it with those fingers, right? Pointer to ring, pointer to middle, instead of uh, you know something else that's not as good, um, it'll make your life a lot easier in the long run and these shapes will make a lot more sense and you will be coordinated enough to get through this section of Erotomania. So let's put the guitar and the keyboard together. Now I'm just going to wrap this up real quick because all Kevin Moore is really doing is playing single notes throughout and sometimes highlighting with chords with quarter notes and then a long arpeggio section going back to the single notes with a beautiful melody I must add and then uh, just ending at the same time as the guitar so check it out how it works together it's pretty cool It's almost like he's creating a ping pong effect with the guitars. It's awesome. So coming off that 4-4 relief fund of the 9-4, we hit our first clean section of the song. Now this whole thing is in 4-4, um, so no weird timing going on. But there are a lot of shapes we have to go through, so let's check that out. <laughs> Let's take that slow. The G sharp going to the flat six, F sharp to the natural six, B one to two, and then one to three, resolving to C sharp. Okay, same motion. E with the one to two, F sharp at the ninth fret power chord this time, E at the seventh fret, and then this major third shape for an F sharp. So don't mute the G string or the higher string of the shape, but mute the lower one. See? So once again, John Petrucci is using the open B and E string to give us those beautiful glassy arpeggios. Of course, have it on the middle pickup selector on the uh, Ibanez JP. So let's go through chord by chord. That's a G sharp with an added flat six. Because we have one, five, flat three, flat six, which actually gives it a beautiful dissonant sound. We then hop up to this, an F sharp chord in first inversion on the guitar, um, but with an eleventh and a flat seven. So this is an F sharp seven and eleven. We then hit a B eleven, and then this C sharp minor seven. We hop down to E, F sharp, 7 with the 11. Then we go into these inverted chords, E over G sharp, F sharp over A sharp, just like we did before. And then that leads into our key change, which we're not going to get to yet because we still have to look at the bass part. So check out the bass and that guitar part played together. And uh, we're going to take a look at the chords that are happening. up the G sharp minor scale until we hit a high A sharp. We're starting off with G sharp as the one, flat seven in first inversion, F sharp, root position B, which is the three chord, root position C sharp, 
which is the four. We then skip to E, which is the flat six chord in root position, to F sharp, which is the flat seventh chord in root position. Now by this point, the bass has had enough of the G sharp, okay? Because we already hit it before. We're now on a B, so John Myung is actually causing this chord to be inverted. It turns that G sharp minor chord into a first inversion G sharp minor, and then continues up to a second inversion F sharp chord. So that F sharp 7 out of 11 is in second inversion. It's over a C sharp. It continues to climb up, now we have a B11 chord uh, over a D sharp, so first inversion. And then, continuing on, C sharp minor in first inversion. Now John Myung is on the E, so he's not going to go anywhere now because he's primed up to hit the E chord already. We went from a C sharp minor 7 over E to now a regular E chord. Yeah. Root position F sharp 7 with an added 11th. First inversion E major, first inversion F sharp major, just like in the distorted parts before. This composition is really amazing, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's amazing stuff. The next section of Arado Mania is the setup to the second guitar solo. And basically all you're doing is playing a pedal tone, a B, the entire time, just like this. That's it. And then, do this, ready? Now this pedal tone is just used to make this part sound a little more tense and a little different than the next section which has the same exact chords. Now Kevin Moore is playing this, uh, this chord progression on top of it. It's a B, to C sharp minor, to E, to F sharp, rolls back around again, the one chord, B, two chords, C sharp minor, And he's really just outlining certain melody notes that Petrucci plays in the guitar solo in the future. Yes, 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 the beautiful lounge sounds of Kevin Moore. Guitar Solo 2 of Arado Mania is probably one of my favorite guitar solos. It's not crazy hard to play, it's not super technical, but it does its job by being beautifully played and beautifully melodic. Let's talk about the rhythm first. It's basically a non-pedal toned version of the previous section. But this time, instead of being static on the B, the rhythm guitar and the bass are going through the chords, right? So it would be B, which is your one chord, C sharp, your two chord, E, which is your four, F sharp, five, rinse and repeat, come on through, and then a quick E, F sharp, to B. Probably the most basic rhythm track that Dream Theater will ever have to offer. Now let's get into the guitar solo. Check out how beautiful it sounds with everything going. So we start off by sliding into the 4th fret of the B string from above, okay? So we're getting a little fancy here. And then we have sliding perfect fourths coming from the top and resolving into the chord. And all we're doing here is playing the 3rd scale degree, 4th, 5th, and then resolving into a C sharp minor, or a C sharp minor 7. That B and the E on the top, that's the flat 7 and the minor 3rd. Makes perfect sense. Then we come in with a fast triplet run starting at the 4th fret of the D string. And we're going 4, 6, 8, 4, 6, 8 on both strings. And we're ending with a half step bend on the 8th fret on the G string. So, just like that. You're just going up the B major scale. This is in the key of B, by the way. Shouldn't be a surprise. We come in with this next part as a hammer-on and a pull-off on the 4th and 5th fret. 
Okay, and once again, we're outlining the E and the F sharp chords here. So we're actually starting on the E, we're going major seven down to the fifth and sliding into the fifth of the F sharp chord, okay? So check out how to play that. You're going hammer on, pull off, pull off to the open, going to the unison note on the G and sliding into the sixth fret for the F sharp. Now the last lick of that half goes like this. This is a very uh, Jimi Hendrix inspired type of lick. Now that can be kind of tricky to play if you're not used to that kind of thing. What you have to do is bar the 11th fret, the A, D, and G with your pointer finger and you're going to hammer into the 13th fret of the A string and then hit that perfect fourth interval on top that you're already holding down coming back into that note and then doing a hammer on pull off from the 11th and 13th and then we slide from the 13th down to the 11th on the A string and hit now a bar on the 9th fret A and D string and then do this 9, 11 and then into the 9th fret of the A and the D so let me play that slow very tasteful Here's the first half slow. The second half of the solo comes in with a nice melodic bit, just like the first half. We're actually playing the same exact notes, but in a different position. We're now at the eighth fret of the G string instead of the fourth fret of the B. But both of those notes are D sharp. 3, 4, 5, minor 3rd of the C sharp, and then we're doing a flat 7 to root to flat 7. That's a very, very, very tasty and melodic move. That's beautiful. Then we repeat ourselves and do another fast triplet run. This time we're on the 11th fret of the G, doing the same pattern. 11, 13, 15, 12, 14, 16. And then eventually we're going to wind up at the 12th fret of the high E string for uh, that E chord. All alternate picking on the way up too. Don't stop that alternate picking. We close it off with a bend, some hammer-ons and some pull-offs just like this. So we're resolving up to the B and then we do this. Now that's a really nice pentatonic run. We're basically playing the uh, the G sharp minor pentatonic position, um, but we're playing it over a B chord. Since the G sharp minor is the relative minor to the B, it's fine. We can do that. And all these notes work perfectly coming back into the B chord. And the only two fingers you really need are your pointer and your ring finger. You, should, you can just chop your middle finger off, you can chop your pinky off, because you don't freaking need them anymore. Just cut them off, like this. <laughs> Now the articulation on that could be a little tricky, probably a little hard to get at first, um, but just check this out. So I'm starting off at the 16th and 19th fret of the B string with a hammer on, picking the string transition, doing another pull off from 19 to 16 on the E string, and then I'm picking all the way down. All right, so you're pulling off on the way down and picking the other strings as you're moving down as well. So. See that? Hammer and a pull, pick, 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 pick. And then you do the same thing. Pull, pick, 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 pick. Pull, pick, 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 pick. Chromatic note resolution on the weirdest note in the world. So for this section, we're modulating into the key of D, okay? So different forms of D major. Uh, we're mode mixing, of course, just like with every Dream Theater song. We're back to complicated chord progressions. That's kind of the idea I'm trying to relay here. Now, we're starting off with a D going like this. To a B flat over D, but that B flat is a tritone, so you're holding the third and the fifth fret of the G and the B resolving to the third and the sixth. 
playing that rhythm all over the note D. So that's a one to a flat six in first inversion, okay? A major one. And then we hit this. You're holding the fifth fret of the A and the D string, the seventh fret of the G, and the eighth fret of the B string for this big G power chord on top of a D. Okay? Now this G power chord acts as a sus4 moving into a D chord. So you're going like this. And you're just going to be barring the seventh fret of the D, G, and B. So. Now I must also add that that is a measure of seven. Okay, so we're going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right into the next part. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. All right, so that, that part's a little crazy there. So we're going from an A power chord to a G power chord, like this, to a C chord. Barred at the fifth fret, D, G, and B, and then an open G triad. Just open D, G, and B strings. Now that's pretty easy, right? A, G, C, C, G, G, or 5. Now aside from that measure of 5, 8, we have something to talk about in the bass line here. The bass is just playing a static A under that entire thing. So really, this is an A, one chord, a subtonic chord on top of the one. So it's really like this. It's kind of like Beavis and Butthead. Then we do this. That's an A minor 7. When you play a C major chord on top of an A, it becomes an A minor 7. And then we're playing G over A. So that's like a massive sus chord. So a lot of sus going on. This is very sus. Goes out to all those sussy uh, gamers that James Labrie keeps talking about. And don't forget that 5-8 measure at the end. The next part comes back to a D chord, except we have it in first inversion, like this. Alright, so you're holding down the second fret of the low E, second fret of the G, and the third fret of the B. Just like that. Mute the A string. Don't play the high E either. And then we lead up with these single notes to a B flat sus2. Alright, so we're immediately going first inversion 1 chord, major 1, to a flat 6 with the sus2, and then we're doing this, a double sus, sus to C, okay, so we're going to the flat 7 chord in the key of D, but we're resolving, okay, and we're also sussing, so more sussing, Now the next section we're actually hanging on G, so we modulate into the key of G temporarily, we're going, just hold the 3rd fret of the low E string, mute the A, and then play open G, B, and B. So you play the low E string, 3rd fret, mute the A, and then play D, G, and B, open. And then you kind of come in, sneak this in. And now you're playing an E flat over a G. Alright, so a first inversion flat 6 chord. So it's kind of like the same progression. The D going to the B flat is a 1 to flat 6. This is a G going to an E flat, which is a 1 to flat 6. Then we have some more sus chords. We're going a C sus4, resolving to a C. Then we hit this. We're going into like a flat 7. Did you catch that lick? Hammer into the first fret of the A string, hit the open G, let it ring, and then do this. You're doing a 1 3 on the A, 1 3 on the B string. So you're actually creating like a C add 9 chord. Bending the F very slightly, and then hitting the G again. So, right into a G chord. This time we're pedaling a little bit, same chords. Now those Skinnered chords are basically an F sus2, you got F, G, and C, which is 1, 2, 5, with a hammer on on the D string then hammer into the second fret to create a C chord in first inversion. The exact same thing, and then hammer the first fret of the A again. And then we go like this. Did you see what I did there? I snuck my thumb on the bottom because if I don't use my thumb, I can't hold the first fret of the B string and let it ring out. And in the recording, it's definitely ringing out. So check that out again. And even try to bend it a little bit with your thumb as well. 
Kevin Moore's keyboard line is just a single note synth, a string synth, and uh, just take a listen to it. It's very, very, very tasteful. I'm sure you'll recognize it if you've heard this song before, but hey, just take a listen to the guitar and the keyboard playing at the same time and see, uh, see how you like it. So a lot of that extravagance, the sussy extravagance of that last section, is featured in a later part of this same exact suite. Part number three, The Silent Man, has a very similar view on that chord progression. Now we'll get there when we get there. This next section we're going to hit, I'm going to call the instrumental break. Now you might be wondering, Michael, this is an instrumental song. How can you have an instrumental break in a song that's already instrumental? Now in this context we mean instrumental as meaning no vocals, okay? So no James Labrie. James Labrie, just, just get out of here. Go back to Canada. Now what I'm trying to convey here is that this section we're about to analyze is by far the most technically and analytically difficult section to really wrap your heads around. Um, with all the, the fast guitar parts, all the different chord progressions in the background. This is truly the instrumental section that showcases all of the talents and abilities of each individual member of the band and also shows their general sense of cohesion with one another. They all know each other's parts. That's the whole thing. Now before we get into all that nonsense, I'm going to hit what I call the pre-instrumental section to the instrumental of the instrumental. Remember, Erotomania is already an instrumental, but the parts before it don't really convey what we're about to convey here. This is a much more complex section than anything we've seen so far. We roll in with a very familiar chromatic drop down, starting at the third fret of the E string, just going G, F sharp, F, E, G, F sharp, F, E with the same time signatures as well that we were featuring before. And the second time we come up the octave, we play it once through. And then we end this pre-instrumental instrumental break with this. So we have our first series of uh, true arpeggios being outlined. The first of which being the G from the root note, uh, which is the flat three. The next is based on F sharp, but it's actually a D major chord in first inversion. And then we hit an F major, so we're doing a flat two. That's just an F major arpeggio, doesn't get any easier than that. And then we hit this, just coming down five, flat three, one. So in total, that sounds like this. All within that little spidery position. All four fingers in that spot, you're good. Now we really start getting into the meat and potatoes of this instrumental break. Take a listen to the entire section with just the guitar and the keyboards outlined and tell me what you see. I'm going to put a lot of the chords up on the uh, up on the board so to speak while you're listening to it and uh, we're going to break it down section by section into six different parts. Now, this is also going to include the pre-instrumental as well, okay? So you got the pre-instrumental and then six instrumental sections that make up this larger whole. Check it out.
let's take a moment to break down section one of this larger break. I'm going to start off with a harmonic analysis first, so basically Kevin Moore's keyboard part, um, and then we're going to break down the guitar right after that. So the keyboards are starting on a measure of 5-4 with the chord B major, going down a B7, okay? So we can call this like a 5 chord in the key of E minor, and you'll see why in a second. In the next measure of 6-4, we hit E minor for the first three beats, which uh, we can consider the one chord, and then immediately we go to an E major for the second half of the measure. Now that E major right there, I would call a five chord within the key of A minor. Now I'm gonna go ahead and say it right here. The fundamental basis, the key center of this entire section, I would say is an A minor. If you were to put everything under an umbrella, that would be the true key center. So let's remember that as we're going through these different modulations. Technically we started in uh, a B, which would be a 5 of 5, right? But it goes to E minor, but then very quickly hits the E major, which indicates, okay, that's a dominant function for sure. Anytime you see a flat 7, always sniff out if we're, we're doing something dominant. Now, of course, John Petrucci follows all of those parts masterfully, right? So let's go over the first measure. We have this. Now, that measure of 5-4 outlines a B dominant chord, okay? So you're starting on the D sharp, first inversion, and then going right to the flat 9. Now, the flat 9 is a very, uh, very tense interval, but it works perfectly on top of a dominant chord. Now, the resolution happens on a G, which is a flat third of the E minor, like this. That's the first half of the 6-4 measure, and then we hit the major chord by outlining a dominant 7, which then resolves to A before it even gets a chance to hit in A major chord, which I think is pretty cool. Check that out. Flat 7, major third, tritone interval and then down to an A, but we never hit an A chord. Very curious, but another strong reason why I say we're in A minor. Now section two is actually a unison riff between uh, Kevin Moore and John Petrucci. So Kevin Moore is playing the same part that the guitar is playing, so that's really all we have to go over here. <laughs> these different chords by jumping up very large intervals, sometimes ninths, sometimes tenths, other times we're getting all the way up to the fifth up the octave, whatever the hell number that is. So we start off with a sextuplet rhythm, that's six notes per beat, tripola triple and boom, and you want to kind of accent that last note in a C Lydian mode. So we're starting on the C, we're extending all the way up a ninth, coming down the scale, which we now know as being E minor, and ending on the F sharp, which is the sharp fourth. Up a ninth, down to the sharp fourth. Now, we continue the pattern downward, just a step, but we're changing the note by a minor third, so we have some different uh, melodic aspects going on here. The next chord is an A minor, which goes all the way up to the minor third in this position, just 5, 4, 2, 5, 4, 2 on the guitar, ending on the perfect fifth, okay? So this would be considered the four chord in the key of E minor, or we're kind of temporarily sneaking back to one. Okay, a lot of these chords are within two different keys. You have C and A minor, uh, in A minor and E minor, they're just different functions. And we're going to see more of that coming up just now. The next outline chord is an E. You're just coming down another step. Okay, we're going from C to B, but on the D and A strings this time. And everything is really congruent in terms of patterns. We're not changing any patterns from string to string. We're going 975, 975. Now this is just outlining a uh, an E minor scale, going up to the fifth, down to the flat seven of the chord. So we're going, that's the harmonic relationship there. And then the root note comes up to a G major, now this is going to be the, uh, the flat third of the E minor or the flat seven of the A minor, depending on uh, the way you're looking at it. And we're hitting these notes, up a ninth, back down to the fourth, just like we did on the C chord as the first one. So those four slow. Now 
Now it doesn't stop here. I'm going to include this little transition as being section two as well. So this whole section starts off on top of a B diminished chord, but over an F. So, and we're almost outlining it as if it's an F add nine chord to keep with the consistency of the C and the G chord from before. F a nine leap down the scale to the sharp four. This is just like the C chord, but then we're going right back up. All through a measure of three. Triplets, 16th note triplets. Triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it, triple it. And that is an entire measure of three. Very hard to play quickly and cleanly as well, let me add. And that's all over a B diminished over F. Now a B diminished, hmm, let me think, let me think. Where does that come from? A minor, right? A B diminished or the key of C major. It's the leading tone in C major, but it's the two chord in A minor. So I think this is beautiful. The next two measures are the same exact shape on the D and the G string. So for the guitar, we're doing this. That is two sets of sextuplets over two beats, over a D chord, all right? So we're outlining a D dominant chord, and then immediately to the same thing on an E dominant chord. So just take the same shape and play it two frets higher. So just a real quick recap, the chords go like this. B diminished over F, G major, E major, and then this next section goes right to D minor, which uh, I'm going to show you right now. Now this is probably one of the more memorable sections of Arado Mania. I remember first hearing this actually on their live Metropolis 2000 DVD, which is jam-packed with almost four hours of music. You should go check it out. We're starting off on a D minor chord, which I'm going to call the four chord, going to a B fully diminished, to a C, which is the leading tone going to either the major one or the flat three of the A minor chord, whatever. It's a relative major to minor relationship. And then we immediately go up to this, which looks like a D7 to me. So we're going to call it a D7. You can also call it an F sharp diminished over a D, potentially, but uh, I'm going to call it a D7 here, a fake out five chord. Going to a B fully diminished to a G sharp fully diminished. Now, fun fact, and I'm not going to write this down as a fun fact, but I'm going to tell you, this is going to be an oratory fun fact. A G sharp fully diminished seven is the same as a B fully diminished seven, which is also the same as a D fully diminished seven and an F fully diminished seven. So just keep that in mind. But we go through a B fully diminished seven and a G sharp fully diminished seven, immediately resolving to an A minor chord. Hey, I think we might have hit our one chord right to A major. Fake out. We got a five chord which then goes right to our new one in our key center, which is really a four, but I'm gonna save that for the next section. Now, just like I was saying before, the guitar goes through these arpeggios in a very brilliant way. So we start off with this D minor. Now, this is very interesting. You're just starting off on an A and doing this little pull off coming in there. That's a grace note, so. And you have to hit that each time you come down a string. So, all the way down the pattern. Now the bottom half of that pattern is the B diminished. So we're starting off with a D minor up top, going down B diminished, resolving to the C. And we always hit the root notes too on the way down. So Petrucci's not only outlining the upper part of the arpeggios, but we are also hitting the bass line at the bottom as well. And I should also mention that each of those grace notes are going to be done with your middle finger because you're going a half step above what you would be playing. So you get some very interesting flavors by hitting notes that are almost out of key, but you're hitting them so fast that it just adds a little bit of a blip effect to it. The next chord we're outlining is a C chord, but interestingly enough, John Petrucci is adding an A into the mix. So this is really a C6 or an A minor in first inversion. 
So kind of a tricky pattern there. You're going all the way from 12, 9, 10, 7, 9, 5, 8, 5. We are experiencing erotomania encoded within these chord progressions. Anytime you see a 6-9 chord, you better close your nose because it's going to start to get stinky. We come beyond the 6-9 and we just do this, which is root to 6. Or at this point, we could call it flat third to root if you want to call it an A minor, but I'm going to keep it simple. We're going to say it's a C chord. We then resolve into the B, which is a very simple, fully diminished arpeggio coming all the way down. Same thing down all four strings. But this time, because of the bass line going B to G sharp, the leading tone changes from being B to C to now being G sharp to A. So we transition perfectly to an A minor, which is, remember, our key center for the entire section. Now the A minor is represented like this. So you're just going perfect fifth to minor third, root, flat seven, and now we're setting up the A major immediately after. So this right here is obviously an A7. You got the perfect fifth, this time the major third, and then one flat seven. So you're doing the same idea in two different octaves. However, one is minor and one is major. Go figure. Now that resolves right into a D minor chord which starts off the next section of this instrumental break. So let's keep on going. Now the D minor would represent a 1 in this case because the A major is obviously a 5 chord. The fourth part of the instrumental section goes like this. Now let's talk harmonically what's happening first. The, uh, the keyboards and the bass kind of go hand in hand. The bass is actually a response to the call of the guitar. So when the guitar goes first like this, on that D minor chord, right on the next chord, on the G chord, the bass is responding with this, resolving to the E. And then of course when it comes up to this, the bass responds with this. So that's kind of the re resolution from the A major, major third, to the D minor, and then right into the G chord. So a very, uh, very clever way of doing a call and response with these uh, kind of uh, meandering sounding chords. But we're not really meandering, remember. Harmonically speaking, the keyboard is just going D minor to G, D minor, D, A major, D minor, G, and then all these different inversions of E7 in whichever way you want to slice it. Now guitar side, we're outlining these arpeggios using almost some inversions here. So we're going with the D minor like this, starting on an F, going up to a G, which is the next chord, so that makes sense. And then right on that E major, that only touches for a very quick second, we're hitting an E major triad. That makes sense as well. On the A chord, we're doing a trill going from the major third to the sus four also makes sense. This seems to make a lot of sense now, doesn't it? It's not meandering, trust me. So we're dealing with the D minor to the G chord like this. Very specific notes in the chords. Flat third to root, perfect fifth to major sixth, so that's a Dorian idea. And then we're doing a hammer on and pull off on a G major arpeggio going down to the open D string and then just hitting fourth to fifth leading in to the next chord, which is the E major. So this is the E7 section, and we are using a Phrygian run in the guitar part. So we're playing the A minor scale on top of an E major, which kind of creates some clashes within the harmony. It creates an altered sound. So we have this. So that's a one going to a flat two. That's the Phrygian mode. And then we have B to C, another Phrygian, E to F, one to flat two again. And then all natural notes in the A minor scale. Okay, so nothing really too crazy going on here. It just creates a very tense and uh, type of effect. Check out what happens at the end. You see that lead up? That lead up goes E, F, G, A, or 
to B flat, which is a tritone away from where we just were. Now, this isn't that crazy. I know it seems crazy, but it's not that crazy. We're actually just modulating into the key of D minor temporarily, which we're going to use to get back into A minor, of course. Um, now this B flat is the flat six chord, but we're gonna go over that in the next section coming up right here. Now I'm going to stop it short right there because we have a lot more fast notes to get to than just that simple little bit. But because we're in a completely new key, I have to separate this from the other part. So we're starting off in B flat in a measure of 5-4 using the Lydian mode to scale it. Right on that downbeat we're hitting the B flat again, but that's actually on a C chord because it resolves immediately. Let me play it slow for you. Those fast notes are really hard to play slowly. So let me play the chords that are being outlined by the bass line. So we have B flat for a measure of five. C for a measure of four. B flat over D and C over E for two beats each. Now, let me scat that for you. That's exactly how it goes. And the B flat and C are just the flat six and flat seven chords of the D minor key center, which we're going to use to pivot back to A minor eventually, but that's not going to happen until we get through this last fast section. Check it out. Before we get to the exciting part, which is John Petrucci's guitar, let's talk about the chord progression for a second. We're starting off actually on a G minor, which is the four chord to the four chord, which is D minor. We're going to the B flat, which is the flat six chord of the four chord, which is the D minor. Then we're hitting D minor, which is the one chord of the four chord, but now we're actually at the four chord. Sorry guys. Then we're going right to a G major, which is the flat seventh chord now of A minor, because we're going right to A minor here, right? E major coming up for the, the major five, the dominant chord. F is the flat six to A, D minor is the four chord, and then it comes to E seven as the last chord. So we're ending on that five chord, which I'm going to elaborate on in a little bit. Let's check out this guitar part. So we're starting off in a position right at the 14th fret. Now you got to get your pointer, your middle, and your pinky rolling real hard on this boy because we're doing some string skipping shit. That's the first pattern and that goes over the G minor chord. All right. Now these are all notes within the key of D minor. So if you know your D minor positions, just use them and follow the tab. The important part is that you use the pointer, middle, and ring to play every single one of these strings in these positions. So you're going from 14th to 17th and 13th to 17th, but you're going to use the same fingers all the way throughout. Another thing to note is that these are quintuplet rhythms. That's right. Quintuplets. It's not six. It's not sextuplets. It's not an even amount. They're actually an odd number of notes you have to cover before you get to the end of the uh, the end of the phrase, so you're going... If you didn't play those in quintuplets, you would never be able to fill out that measure in time. But since we're playing those, we can do that. We move the same idea down a whole step. This is over the B flat. Let me play that slow. Beautiful. It sounds really nice played slow. I don't know why John Petrucci doesn't just slow down, right? You're moving too fast through life, JP. Calm down. Let's move into the next part. Now I'm going to try and break this up as best as I can. I'm going to go chord by chord. So for now we're going to go from the D minor to the G major chord. Now the D minor chord here can be seen more as a two chord maybe, like a two five in the key of C. Now we are in the key of A minor, so I'm going to call it four to flat seven. 
but it's effectively the same thing as a 2-5 function, so just keep that in mind. Now we're outlining the D major chord by doing this, so we're ending on the perfect fifth of the D, and then we're coming to the G major on this line. Then we come to the A minor with this, do that down the octave, come up to the E chord, the dominant E chord like this, because we're hitting that G sharp in the middle. Beautiful, right? Climbing up the scale, harmonic minor scale, coming back down to the lower octave, doing the same type of idea, just different notes. That's E major, and then we hit the F chord like this which is like an F Lydian, right, with the sharp four and the major third and all that good stuff. We come down again to this, that's the same shape, but down an octave from there, but this is over now really the D chord, and then we have to finish off with this. That really insanely fast run, check that out, five, three, one, up, two, three, five, all those notes have to be used to fill out that entire thing. And then of course we hit a big E at the end. So, wow, that is insane. Now I forgot to note that those last two bars, the F and the D, represent measures of three. Everything else is a measure of four. So from the G minor, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, E flat, three, four, one, two, 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 three, one, two, three, boom, right into a big E dominant chord. Now, the interesting part about this is that the dominant seventh chord acts as both the five chord of the A minor, but even better yet, it sets up the next section as a flat seventh chord because we're going to an F sharp minor riff, right? Which sounds like this. Right, a little time change. Right back in. That <laughs> sounded like shit. Now the interesting part about that F sharp is that it represents the relative minor of the parallel major. That means we were, we've been in the key of A minor for quite some time, moving in and out, but now we're going to a minor of the major. So we're changing A minor to the parallel major, which is A major, very simply put. And we're going to the relative minor, which is F sharp minor. We're playing basically a blues riff, right? Just going F sharp, B, C sharp, E, flat seven, flat third to flat seven. Just all pentatonic minor stuff. There's really nothing crazy going on. However, there is something incredibly crazy going on. I want you to take a listen to the guitar and the keyboard part playing together and see if you can figure out what's going on. If not, I'll tell you right after. Now, the keyboard, Kevin Moore, the genius, the, uh, the misunderstood genius of the group, has done it again. He is playing the most intense hemiola based off of the main riff that was played at the beginning of the song, but by the guitars. See, Kevin Moore didn't get to play it up until this point, which is, to me, absolutely insane. So what he's doing is playing the main riff in a measure of five and a measure of nine over and over again until it evens out song. So when you play that measure of 5-4 and 9-8 uh, a total of four times, it matches up with what the rest of the band is playing in. Now the rest of the band is playing in 4-4, four, four, or I should say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 measures of 4 and 1 measure of 2-4. Okay? Now 9 measures of 4 equates to really nine measures of eighth notes because the keyboard riff is playing eighth notes in a hemiola 
So think about it like this. Kevin Moore is playing 10-8, 9-8. 10-8, 9-8, 10-8, 9-8, 10-8, 9-8 which is 76 notes total when it comes to the end. The nine measures of four, or in this case, eight, eight, is gonna get us to 72, and then we add the extra measure of two, which is actually four eighth notes, to get 76. So all the members of the band, and Kevin Moore's absolutely estranged personality, actually link up after playing two completely contradictory parts. Contradictory. I said contradictory instead of contradictory. I'm moving too fast here too, just like uh, John Petrucci was on that last part. Maybe I'm starting to become uh, erotomaniacally disdained. Maybe I'm starting to become erotomaniacally uh, programmed here. Immediately after that last measure of 2-4, we finally come back into the main riff of the song, but this time we're a little more open. There's open hi-hat in the background. We're kind of a little looser, a little more free, because we just got a relief of uh, getting out of a neoclassical hellstorm. Now, the only difference between the riff being played this time as opposed to previously during the song is we're using pinch harmonics on the third fret and the fifth fret. So once you reach those frets, harmonic that shit up. Do that on every single three and five. Except on the measure of nine eights. Do it, don't do it on the measure of nine eights. You're not gonna have enough time to hit it, okay? We also come into main riff number two. All the same. All the other stuff I explained. And here's the difference. slow it down, and we hang on that C minor chord at the very end, and John Petrucci plays this solo line. Now this is probably one of the hardest licks to play in the entire song because of the sheer fact that it's in free time. And this is one of the very few parts that I don't think were uh, recorded to a metronome. I, I guarantee you most of this song was recorded to a metronome, but this part, definitely not. And uh, that's basically just outlining a really jazzy uh, C Dorian mode. Okay, so we're going from the major ninth up top, using the tenth and the eighth frets respectively on the E and B strings, bringing that same exact thing down the octave. Okay, now the chord tones are major 9, flat 7, major 6, so that's the Dorian, to F, which is the 4th, so that's like an 11. So this is all outlining a C minor 11th chord, but with a natural 6, a Dorian flavor. And then we come out of it with this. More Dorian flavors. trill at the end going from C to D, which is really just the one to the two. Never forget your ones and twos and threes and fours and fives and six and sevens, okay? Those are the most important notes that you can ever imagine. So if you forget them, you're going to be lost on a deserted island with Kevin Moore and John Petrucci. And John Petrucci, let me, let me tell you, he's going to be hungry. He has an appetite for uh, something really bad, so you're going to want to get away from him at that point. The rhythm guitar that happens in the background starts off on a C 11th shape at the 3rd fret of the A string. Then it moves over to a C minor 11th shape in the more proper sense at the 8th fret of the low E string with your middle finger and then your, uh, your other finger is here and you need to bar with your pointer at the top of the 6th fret. Then you go... up on that top note and you play through it pretty quickly two times then we come up to this position we move our pointer finger to the eighth fret now and we go all three time give it some nice whammy jizz at the end and it rings out into the next song of a mind beside itself which is part two voices which we're not going to get to today. Unfortunately, you're going to have to wait a little longer for that one. Um, but hey, so it is. Thanks for coming along this journey. And uh, please like, subscribe, comment on the video. Help me out against this brutal YouTube algorithm. It really tries to shut down uh, 
any small independent content creators that uh, offer valuable information such as this, so please support. All right, everybody. God bless, and I'll see you next time, all right? Voices is going to be the next song, so stick around.